Hello, I'm Deanna Ortelli. And I'm Joseph Benty. This is RTD's Regional Telephone Information Center in downtown Los Angeles. Here, everything you want to know about today's RTD routes and services is just a phone call away. But if you want to know about Southern California's transit yesterday, tomorrow, and in the 21st century, stay tuned. 100 years ago, Southern California was a leader in the development of urban mass transit. Then came the automobile. But now trains in the background for 40 years are on the move again. I'll trace the surprising route that got us to where we are today. Southern Californians are about to have the opportunity to exchange traffic jams for a new generation of high-tech commuter trains. It's called Metrolink. I'll take a train ride of my own. An exclusive preview run on LA's new Red Line subway. And more than a quick way to get around, the Red Line is an underground art gallery. All this and a lot more on Transit 2000. Southern California's transportation map was laid out long before the first freeway. Many of the same routes we take to work today follow ancient Native American footpaths. These same pathways guided explorers from Mexico, and today cars on the congested Harbor Freeway can sometimes slow to the speed of a 19th century horse-drawn wagon. In 1869, this same route was followed by LA's first railroad, and in 1876, the city was linked to the rest of America by a transcontinental train. This brought an unprecedented population boom in the 1880s. Ever since, transportation played a major role in making Southern California what it is today. William Myers is a railroad historian. Los Angeles owes a tremendous uh, debt to the railroad, both the mainline railroad and the electric trolley, because it was the railroads of Southern California that shaped the, the great village of Southern California that exists today, uh, shaped its pattern of development, created its uh, unified functioning economy. Without railroads, there would be no Southern California. This is the oldest known film of Los Angeles, taken in 1895. Transit horsepower is already hard at work. In fact, the first horse-drawn trolleys date to 1874. And for a while in the 1880s, Los Angeles even had one of the best cable car systems in the world. When electrification came in 1885, streetcar lines were already cutting through the rolling hills around the city and reaching out to newly developing suburbs like Hollywood. During the turn of the century, Henry Huntington's far-reaching Pacific Electric Red Cars fed Los Angeles emerging urban sprawl. By the 1920s, the city had the largest interurban rail system in the world, along with a rapidly expanding fleet of buses, tying it all together. Art Winstead joined the RTD in 1925. I was born in 1906, so I'm 86 years old. And my first bus ride was from Englewood from to uh, Eagle Rock. I rode that bus for 10 cents. The buses it was old clarinet buses with the engine just like some of them old school buses with the engine out there and then the cab. And I started running a company for the Los Angeles Railway Company. And um, that, we worked under that for seven years. Then she went to um, MTA, then to Transit Line, Metron Transit Line, now I'm back to what we got now. So I've seen all those changes. There have been a lot of changes, but traffic jams are not new to Southern California. By the end of the 1920s, transit trains and automobiles were elbowing each other for space on downtown Los Angeles streets, and the automobile was winning. Rescued by gasoline rationing during World War II, the red cars had one last gasp in the 1940s and then began to disappear. In 1963, the last train finished its run between Long Beach and L.A. and headed straight for the scrap heap. There is no more controversial question in the entire history of Southern California than what happened to our trolley cars. We allegedly had the most wonderful, uh, largest electric railway system in the entire United States, in all of North America, perhaps in the entire industrialized world. Why don't we have it today? 
The traditional conspiracy theory for the death of the trolley says that one or more large corporations conspired to buy up the trolleys, kill them deliberately in order to sell their own products. Gasoline, rubber tires, automobiles, cement for highways. You know, you, you can fill in the blank with the name of your favorite villain. It's a game a lot of Southern Californians like to do. My feeling is, as unpopular as this view may be, if you want to look for the villain as to who killed the red cars in Southern California, look around to all of us who lived here then and chose to buy that automobile not to ride the trolley. Whatever the truth about the death of the red cars, 30 years later, Southern Californians are facing a transit renaissance. And ironically, the first reborn train, the Blue Line, follows the route of the last of the red cars. I think training in the buses is quite important. I, I still think that. And I don't know why they took them all off. It's not small. Now we put them back on again. <laughs> so so I'm sure that they should have kept them on there. I, as a historian, find it both ironic and satisfying that we are coming full circle now and realizing that we need not just automobile dependency, but we need a range of different transportation technologies to provide our transit needs. There is less and less economic incentive to own a personal automobile. And as the rail lines grow more and demonstrate their ability to economically rejuvenate outlying areas, you will see an eager return to rail transit. But of course, this is also contingent on one important factor. The trains have to be run professionally. Uh, they have to be run on time. The fares have to be valid and economically feasible. And there have to be a lot of trains. When this happens, rail transit will well and truly have returned to its traditional important niche in the history of Southern California's economic development. <laughs>